In this video, you will learn to use an infrared sensor with the Arduino. It works by using infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye. There are several common uses for sensors like this. One is simply to detect the presence of a nearby object. You can see here the LED lights up when I move my finger in front of the sensor. Another common use is to detect the difference between light and dark surfaces. You can see here that when I move the sensor back and forth, the LED only lights up when the sensor is over the white piece of tape. This is commonly used in line following robots or if you want to build an Arduino autonomous car and have it drive around on a roadway with lane markings. Let's start by taking a closer look at the sensor. It's pretty tiny, so I'll do my best to zoom in here. The sensor actually consists of two parts in a single plastic package. It has an infrared LED, which emits infrared light, which again is not visible to the human eye. And then the other side is something called an infrared phototransistor. Now, transistors are a more advanced topic in electronics, so we're not going to get into how they work in too much detail. But basically, it works as a detector, so it can detect or measure when infrared light is bounced back to the sensor. So if you have a bright enough object in front of the sensor that reflects infrared light, it will detect when that happens. If there is a darker object in front of the sensor, or there is nothing in front of the sensor, so the infrared light just gets sent out and never gets reflected back, then that transistor won't detect any reflected light. On the back, the sensor has four pins, so each one of those parts, the LED and the phototransistor, have two pins. You will need male to female jumper wires to connect to those pins, so you put the sensor pin into the female end of the jumper wire, and then you use the other end of the jumper wire to connect to your breadboard or your Arduino. If you look at the physical sensor very carefully, you will see that there is a tiny notch in one of the corners, and if you hold it just right so the light reflects off of it, you will actually see the circuit symbol for an LED over on one side. Again, that's next to the clear bulb. And the circuit symbol for a transistor over on the other side next to the dark bulb. So that is going to be important because you don't want to get the sensor flipped 180 degrees when you are connecting it. You need to make the correct connections to all of these pins when you are building your circuit. So we are going to switch over to a computer, look at the sensor's data sheet, and the circuit diagram for how you would connect this to your Arduino. Now, let's take a look at the sensor's datasheet. You may notice that the datasheet calls it an opto interrupter. I have been calling it an infrared sensor. I've also seen them called reflective object sensors or IR emitters detectors. There are different types of these sensors, but they all work on the same principle where they have that infrared LED to emit light and then the infrared transistor to detect the reflected light. But this specific data sheet only applies to this sensor. So if you are using a different sensor and following this video, you may be able to follow some of these same general principles, but you will need to look up the data sheet for your sensor. If you scroll down on the data sheet, you will see the circuit diagram for how the pins are connected on the sensor. You don't need to worry if you don't understand circuit diagram symbols. In this video, I will show you how to connect this specific sensor. But again, if you have a different sensor, you will need to look up its data sheet for which pins are which. So again, the sensor has two parts. On one side, we have the LED that has a pin called the anode, which is the positive side and the cathode, which is the negative side. And again, that is going to send out infrared light. And then on the other side, we have that phototransistor, which has pins called the emitter and collector and this is going to measure that reflected light. And this diagram here shows us a bottom view of the physical sensor where you can see that tiny notch in one corner that again labels the four pins, one anode, two cathode, three emitter, four collector. So we can use this information to figure out how to hook the sensor up to the Arduino. Again, you don't have to figure that out yourself. I will show you how in this video. Here's how I'm going to recommend connecting that sensor. Look at the sensor with the pins facing you. Here is a picture of the physical sensor. Again, it is very tiny, so this picture is kind of grainy when I magnify it, but you should be able to see that there is a tiny notch in one corner of the sensor. That is pin three. So when you hold it like this with that notch in the bottom right, the pins should be ordered counterclockwise starting in the top left. One, two, three, four. Then you are going to connect those male female jumper wires to each one of those pins. Now, normally we don't care about color coding that much. We just make sure to use red for positive or five volts and black for ground. In this case, I'm going to recommend 
following my color coding convention because that makes it easier to keep track of the wires later without having to go back to the sensor and try to figure out which pin is which. So if you set it up like this at the beginning, then you'll always know which color wire corresponds to which pin. So I've used a blue wire for pin one, a black wire for pin two, a green wire for pin three, and a red wire for pin four. You can then connect the sensor to the breadboard as shown here. Note that if you've seen previous videos in this series, we have used Tinkercad Circuits, which is an online circuit simulator that lets you build a circuit and run Arduino code in your web browser. Tinkercad Circuits does not have this particular sensor in its parts library, so this is just a static diagram that I made. It is not a simulation. Let's quickly go over all the connections, starting with pin one in the upper left corner of the sensor with the blue wire. That is connected to a 220 ohm resistor, which is then connected to five volts on the breadboard power bus. Just like a visible light LED, infrared LEDs also need that current limiting resistor to prevent them from burning out if too much current flows through them. Next, we have the ground wire for the LED, which is the black wire on pin two. That is connected directly to the ground bus. Next, we have the green wire on pin three, which I used just for the sake of having a different color wire on each pin, but that is also connected directly to ground, so you could have used a black wire there too because it wouldn't matter if you got them mixed up. Finally, we have the red wire on pin four, which is going over to one of the input pins on the Arduino. You could just plug that directly into the Arduino, but I have it going to a row in the breadboard and I'm then using an additional jumper wire to go over to pin seven. Don't forget that you need your five volt and ground connections from the Arduino to the breadboard power buses. If you don't know how to use a breadboard, remember that you can refer back to the earlier videos in this series. We also have an LED connected that we will be using as an output to indicate when our sensor detects something. Again, many of the earlier videos in this series show you how to hook up an LED, so I'm not going to go over that in detail. But you can pause the video here, and if you haven't already, build the circuit as shown in this diagram. Now let's switch over to the Arduino IDE and look at the code we're going to use with this sensor. Now, don't worry if you found wiring the sensor intimidating. The code is nearly identical to what you have used before to control an LED with a button. Let's take a look at it line by line. First, we declare variables for the pins we are going to be using. We declare those as constants because they will never change throughout the program. We declare another variable for the pin state of the input pin we'll be using with the sensor. That can be either high or low, so it can change. In the setup function, we use the pin mode command to set our pins. We are setting the LED pin as an output, and we are setting the sensor pin as an input with a modifier that you might not have seen before. We are setting it as input pull up, and that is going to activate an internal pull up resistor on the Arduino so you do not need an external pull-up resistor. The purpose of that resistor is to always give this pin a default value of high or five volts unless the sensor activates, in which case it's going to pull that value down low to zero volts. So if you go back to the button video earlier in this series, we used an external resistor for this purpose. Using the internal resistor with the Arduino just makes your circuit a little cleaner because it requires one less part. But if you want a little more explanation of what those pull up or pull down resistors are for, you can go back to the button video earlier in this series. Finally, in our loop, we have pretty much the exact same code you would use with a button. We use the digital read command to read the value of our sensor pin and store that in the pin state variable. Then we have an if else statement where if the pin state is high, that means no infrared light is detected, so the sensor sees a dark surface or it sees nothing, that is going to turn the LED off. Else, if the pin state is low, that means infrared light is detected, so the sensor is seeing a surface that is reflecting the light back, and then we are going to turn the LED on. So, it is time for you to pause the video here, enter this code, upload it to the Arduino, and test out your sensor. When using your sensor, it's very important to remember that it is measuring reflected infrared light, and it has a fairly short range. So for example, even if I hold my hand out here a few inches away from the sensor, you see the LED does not turn on. There's not enough light reflecting back to the sensor to activate the phototransistor. As I move the sensor closer and closer to my hand, 
you see that it eventually turns on when it's just kind of a fraction of an inch or maybe about a centimeter or less from my hand. That reflection depends not only on the distance from the surface, but also the color of the surface. Now remember that humans can't see infrared light, so this reflection isn't identical to what you see with visible light, but a lot of times it will behave very similar, where, for example, black will absorb more infrared light, and lighter colors like white or yellow will reflect more infrared light. But you have to be careful because sometimes black will still reflect enough light to activate the sensor. So, for example, as I move the sensor closer here, it's over the black surface, and you see the LED actually does light up. But, so there, if I have the sensor too far away, I can't tell the difference between the black and the white surface. As I move the sensor closer to the surface, eventually I find a range where the LED does turn off over the black and then does turn on over the white. But it is sensitive to both the color of the surface and the distance from the surface. So, for example, if you're going to mount these sensors on a robot or autonomous car, you need to make very sure that they stay a constant distance from the surface or else you might not be able to properly tell the difference between the surface and the lines you're trying to detect. Now, here's a challenge for you. If you're going to mount these on an Arduino robot or car, you will usually have at least two of them. That allows you to detect whether you are about to cross a line and need your vehicle to turn. So there are two different ways this is usually done. If you were building a line-following robot that is following a single line, you would have two sensors, one on each side of the line. Then if the robot starts to go over the line, one of the sensors will activate and you know you need to turn back in the other direction. The other thing, if you are building more of an autonomous car or lane-following robot that needs to stay in a lane, your robot would be driving in the lane and you would have both sensors inside the lane markers. Then if you start to drift out, you know that you need to turn the opposite direction and stay inside the two lanes. Two lines, sorry. So there's a difference between whether you're building a line-following robot that is following a single line or a lane-following robot that is trying to stay in between two lines, but the use of the sensors is the same in both cases. So if you have a second sensor, pause the video here, see if you can use the circuit diagram and code shown earlier in the video to connect the second sensor the same way you connected the first one, and then modify the program so you can light up a second LED using the second sensor. So you can see here I have added a second sensor and a second LED to the circuit, and the sensors control the two LEDs independently. If I hold my finger in front of one sensor, it lights up the red LED. If I hold my finger in front of the other sensor, it lights up the green LED. I could also use these again for an autonomous car or a line-following robot, where I have one sensor on each side of a line if I'm doing a line-following robot, and then when one of these sensors goes over the line because the robot is drifting away, I would know to correct my steering and get back on the line. Or if I'm doing an autonomous car that's supposed to stay in a lane, I have my two sensors in between the two lines, and then when I start drifting, again, you have to be very careful about the distance from the surface to get that right. But then when I start drifting to one side, one of the sensors will activate. Now, for a vehicle or a robot, you would be controlling motors instead of LEDs. We have separate videos in this series that talk about controlling motors. Let's take a look at the code for doing this, and it is mostly just copying and pasting lines of code and then renaming things because we now have two sensors and two LEDs. So for example, instead of just sensor pin, I have sensor one pin and sensor two pin, LED one pin and LED two pin, sensor one state and sensor two state. I then need to set all of those pins as inputs and outputs in my setup function. And in my loop function, I have two digital read commands, one for each sensor pin, and then I have two if-else statements. One is for checking each sensor's state. So one of the sensors is going to control LED1, and then sensor2 controls LED2. So not really writing any new code, just copying and pasting, again, the same circuit diagram you used before and the same code you used before, but being careful to rename your variables and keep track of which pins you're using. And then you could do the same thing to extend this. If you wanted to have a vehicle with three or four or even more of these sensors, just keep track of your variable names, and you can have as many of them as you want, at least up to the limit of the number of available Arduino pins and the other stuff that you're connecting to your robot.